Because every time there's an issue, every time there's a problem, every time there's a disruption, there's winners and losers. You can look at it as a challenge or you can look at it as an opportunity. The innovation mindset is going to help us take anything that is disruptive and turn it into an opportunity. Put that coffee down. Creators are leaders. Be careful what kind of leaders you're producing here. Helen, we're both in sales. Let me tell you why I suck as a salesman. They realized that to be in power, you didn't need guns or money or even numbers. You just needed the will to do what the other guy wouldn't. I'm not leaving. The show goes on. Well, hello there, friend. Welcome back to the Construction Leadership Podcast. I am your host, Bradley Hartman. On this show, we bring you ideas and insights every single week to help you lead more effectively. This episode is brought to you by the Simple Sales Pipeline, custom built for the construction industry. The Simple Sales Pipeline is the fastest way to take any sales rep or business development manager's backlog of business, existing accounts, and prospecting activity to value and organize it immediately. It's under 30 minutes or less. Learn more at thesimplesalespipeline.com. I'm excited to bring to you today my conversation with Mr. Scott Peterson, Chief Executive Officer of Interstates. What is Interstates? They are smart, reliable, and innovative per their website. They are your trusted partner for design, build, electrical projects, plant floor automation, and mission-critical operation technology support. There's a lot there, I know. Scott attended the University of South Dakota where he majored in accounting and he also picked up his MBA at the same university. He got out, worked for KPMG in finance and accounting, and then worked for Valero Energy in Texas before returning home and working for Interstates. Scott earned the CEO title in 2014 and as you will hear in this episode, is really passionate about and engaged in on a day-to-day basis leadership. And you might say, well, yeah, of course, he's the CEO. And what I mean by that is he is actually involved in the training, the teaching of leadership to other members of the Interstates family. They also have a director of innovation role that we talk about. And between these two, leadership and innovation, in this episode, we really dig into how those elements kind of challenge each other to lead today, developing stronger leaders in the future, while also understanding they need to continuously innovate in the future. And if they don't disrupt themselves, somebody else will. That is something that Scott talks about. And before we go, we also talk about some changes that they are making within their organization to really become an attraction for the most talented of the Hispanic demographic and Spanish speakers specifically. So we dig into all that and more. You, my friends, you're in for a treat. Please enjoy my conversation with Mr. Scott Peterson, Chief Executive Officer of Interstates. As always, thank you for listening. So, Mr. Scott Peterson, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. I'm not sure about the Mr. part, but I do appreciate being here. <laughs> Great. So, let's start here. We're going to go back in the way back machine for a moment, Scott. Tell me where you were and maybe what you were into, what you were passionate about when you were roughly 12 years old, sixth grade. So in sixth grade, one of the things I I remember is that I was actually in uh, uh, Boy Scouts. So from that side of it, we had a really good group of kids in in it and a great scoutmaster and assistant scoutmaster and quite a few Eagle Scouts that came up through the ranks there. But in sixth grade, we'd do camping. We'd camp in the wintertime. Sometimes we didn't necessarily want to, but we'd be camping when it would be snowing out. It'd be sometimes the water might freeze your drinking water and all that kind of stuff. So you can view us as a little on the crazy side, but we had, we had a really good time. We also enjoyed all the sports, you know, basketball is probably my favorite. And I tried baseball and and football and all that kind of, and stuff. And I probably at that time I was probably one of my friends was getting me into uh, golf. Okay. All right. At what point did you realize you had an affinity towards uh numbers and finance? 
Well, you know, a lot of times you have to study harder work uh, during school to get good grades. With math, I didn't have to study too hard. It was it came pretty easy, and uh, so I just always enjoyed it and and was fairly good at it too. Okay, so you end up going to the University of South Dakota mascot is the Coyotes. The Coyotes. All right. All of yes. a sudden, especially with football, all of a sudden people know a lot about football when it comes to North Dakota and South Dakota. Yep. Oh yeah. There, there's quite a rivalry, you know, with basketball and football and all that. Sometimes the University of South Dakota gets confused for University of San Diego or, and we also have a rival school of South Dakota State. And there, a lot of people I work with are from there. They like to be known as the Jackrabbits. Jack and Rabbits. I had a couple of sisters go there too. So we have some interesting uh, mascots in South Dakota for sure. You do. You should. A little, little point of differentiation, which this is something I think we'll come back to a little bit later. I'm really excited to talk to you about kind of the innovation at Interstates, the director of innovation role, but I don't want to get ahead of ourselves here. The thing that you shared with me, Scott, that really stood out on one hand seemed like really obvious that every company would do this. And then the other hand is something really unique. Can you tell me a little bit about the leadership classes that you put on that are taught by the executive leaders within Interstates? Yeah, we have a, uh, almost our our anchor uh, program is Excellence in Leadership, EIL. Okay. And we've been running that for 20 years now. And before that time, one of the things we realized is that there was a lot of leadership training going on, but you'd send them somewhere. You'd send two or three people, they'd bring it back, and they wouldn't necessarily get a lot of traction because the environment didn't change. They might have changed at that event or learned some things, but it was hard to build that habit of really applying that. So we we were brainstorming what we could do, and, and we had a lot of good leaders at the time, and, and we thought we could actually do it in-house. And the reason why we wanted to do it in-house is a couple different reasons. One is that it allows us to train leadership the way we view leadership at Interstates. So it's not like, oh, this is 80% and then it's don't worry about these two. This is how we look at leadership. So it, it creates that continuity. The most important thing, though, it does is really it's a platform to work on our culture. It helps for us to solidify our culture. It talks about how to anchor our culture. Any We have a wide variety of people that go through it. So we'll have field people, we'll have marketing people go through it. We, If any new executive is hired, they go through it just to make sure that they understand leadership and they understand our culture. And it's a, it's a great way to build cross team relationships. So we have people coming in from uh, Cincinnati to from Fort Collins, from all of our regional offices. We have about a class of 18 is kind of our sweet spot. We've done as, as many as 26 and as few as 14, but we've kind of landed on 18. And it's probably one of the coolest things that we do is that we want us to teach leadership to our people. And so we have a lot of our senior leaders come in and take either a half a day or a full day I try to get there as much as I can. So the kickoff is two and a half days. I'm there for a day and a half to two days, sometimes there the whole time. But it gives us them an opportunity for you to them to see you and just a normal person. You hang out, you have lunch with them. You, we do leadership challenges. So we say, hey, this is how you set direction. Now you have to go practice it. And then we incorporate plus Delta feedback, you know, plus this is, if you see something good, you have to say it. If Delta is the Greek symbol for change. So it's not that you did something wrong, but it could be taking something good and making it better. It could be something that went a little bit sideways. And this is one of the things you need to work on potentially going forward. So we try to create that psychological safety to, for them to get in a habit or be prepared to receive feedback because we, in order for people to reach their potential, they have to have someone coaching, they have to have good feedback, and they also need a framework to understand how we operate as a culture and from a leadership perspective. The other interesting thing that I was thinking about is it's one thing to be a good leader. And I, I know a lot of really exemplary leaders that after we had talked, I said, just curious, have you ever taught a class on leadership? And a surprisingly large number of them said, oh, no, 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 that, that's different. Like, that's a different skill set of teaching something that you know versus something that you've acquired. 
Did you and your team have to go through any sort of training, whether formal or informal, to kind of flip that switch to something that might just be natural and easy for some folks, but to then teach it again, that, that is a different skill. Oh, yeah, it, it is. Two of the leaders, myself and uh, Eric Hookstra at the time, we were actually helping another company, FMI, they're, they're a consulting company and leadership development sure. company within the construction industry. We worked as consultants to help them out for a variety of reasons. But one of the reasons why we did it is so we could actually get really good at it. So when we came back, one of the things we did is saying, okay, we can teach this, but we need to incorporate more and more leaders into this model because, you know, you can know the information, but if you have to teach it, that takes it to one or two levels above that. And you really have to know the information. You got to have examples of how to do things. You got to talk about how you made mistakes and just to make it real. And so from that side of it, what we've done is, and it, it's pretty funny because it happens today, almost every time someone presents is someone's in the back writing down feedback. So as soon as I get done, I, I've done it so many times, it doesn't happen every time anymore. But if, if someone's relatively new, I'll be in the back or someone else will be back and say, okay, here's how you did. This is the things you really did exceptionally well. Here's a couple of things you could do differently. What did you feel like? And and so we get them to process and, and it it lives out what we're teaching on a couple different things from teaching it, knowing the material to actually practicing plus Delta feedback. But it, it takes a long time and we, we want to get people say, what are you passionate about? What are you really good at? And if you give them material that they're not passionate about, they're not going to do a great job. But if they are passionate about it, then they can really get into it and share stories and, and make it come alive. Cool. And is this held once per year, Scott? We, we actually have a wait list of 100 people, well, 80 to 100 people going through it. So we normally do two times a year. We have a winter and fall. Once in a while, we'll try to do three, but it taxes the leaders a little too much for us to crank out three, but occasionally we will do that. Okay. Now, you also shared with me part of the training you do with your team. I had written my notes. There's a little bit of a question mark around kind of a values card, but where you help people really write out their personal mission statement and their values. Help me help me revisit that because I remember, and if this was part of this EIL or if this was different, because I thought that was really powerful as well. Yeah. Before we created the EIL program, we tried to help people understand, you know, their purpose, their their personal mission statement, the why. And we really struggled. They'd start filling out the stuff and it just wouldn't get enough traction. They wouldn't do it. So we said, how can we incorporate this in the EIL? Because this is really important for people to understand who they are, their strengths, their weaknesses, their passions. And it's, it's a little bit like a Venn diagram where what are you great at? What do you love? And what does the company need? That's sweet spot. If you can get your job anywhere from 30 to 60% in that sweet spot, that's amazing. Most people don't get to do that because they don't understand what their purpose is or their why. So what we we have a pamphlet we help develop with another company. And then we say, here's your pamphlet. There's three different sessions in EIL. So there's a kickoff, a middle and an end. So we're going to give you some time. We're going to give you a partner. We're going to give you a mentor to process stuff at each of these sessions. And on the third session, you will read your personal mission statement in front of the whole class. And that's a scary thing to do. So people take it seriously. And I would say a third of the class, normally they say it's one of the best things that came out of the whole class. And then we have different exercises. One is the value cards. So you start out with 52 values. You know, it could be fun. It could be family. It could be competition. It, you know, what are, what are the things that really gets your energy up, what you're really passionate about? And then you have to go from 52 to 26. And we have an activity to help through that down to, so you end up with your top five. And then you have to pick your number one. Because your personal mission statement, your why statement has to have something that gets you really excited and and it helps guide you through decisions and, and just helps you with life. Because if you understand who you are, what you're passionate about, it makes life a lot easier because you, you can say no to things instead of getting distracted. Scott, I love that. My my workshop brain is is going on overdrive right now as I think about how you do that. Because when you think about, imagine you start with 52 values, 
I bet it would be like looking at a whole different pile of ice cream. You're like, oh, I like that. I like that. And then, then you start whittling it down and force ranking. Well, that's a, that's a different mindset where you, you have to cut things out to help folks get to a top five and then a top one. What do you do to help them do that? Cause I think once you get that clarity, that really helps people inform behavior as opposed to what I think people naturally do, which is kind of a, a laundry list. It's easier for me to put 51 things out of 52, the one thing I don't like, as opposed to narrowing it to four. So how do you guys do that? So in the beginning, what we normally do out of the 52 cards, we said three piles. This is, yeah, this is me. Anybody I would talk to would say that. That's what I'd love to do. These maybe, maybe are me and these are not me. And in general, there's way more, not that many, not me's. So you end up at that level. You can say, okay, now you should have this kind of leveled out. And then you said, grab the middle pile and try to cut that in half. And the story we use, it's a desert exercise. You're stuck on the desert. And now you can have this water, but you have to give up 10 cards. Which 10 are you going to give up to get this? So it's, it's a little bit of a story that keeps repeating itself. And the first round's not too bad. The second round, when you're going from like 26 down to 13, it's like, you know, people are fighting you and, and they're no, 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 this is, I can't do this. I can't give that many up. Okay. No, you have to give it up. I mean, you don't have a choice. What are you going to do? So there's a lot of negotiating and whining and all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's really interesting. And then you, you give them time to process it. So usually they can get there on their own, but they have to verbalize it or they have to walk themselves through it. It's like, I'm comparing this card to this card. Which one is more me? How would people describe me? How do I want to be described? What, you know, how have I made decisions? Which one's more influences me more? So it, it's as much as self-reflection as, as opposed to aspirational. You mentioned something interesting there, Scott, which is, it almost, I found in, in our own workshops is it's really helpful to have a group of people because whether it's things that they're, they're great at or attributes that they share that really stand out, sometimes you need other people that work with you to identify that in you because we're good at it and we just assume everybody else is good at it or it's something that we don't really think is a differentiator. And where I say, oh my gosh, Scott, this comes so easily to you. You exude this character trait that really makes you a great leader. And you're thinking, seriously, like, I don't know, I, it, that never occurred to me. So it's that process. Um, you mentioned the difference between a to-do list and a to-be list. Is that tied in here or is that something tangential? It can be. I, I think one of the things is the the to-be list is a relatively new concept. And, and when we're coming across different books, you know, there's a lot of awesome information and books out there. And what we don't want to be is a flavor of the month. So what, what we normally look at it is this book came from Mackenzie. There's several authors that got together and wrote about a book called CEO Excellence. So what are the mindsets of leaders that, whether it's public or private, that have had a a great career and, you know, well-respected, really built good cultures and, and sustainability. So that came out of that book. It's a great concept, but you also have, you have to discern whether or not it fits into your culture and how will it fit into your culture. So your to-be list is a list of, it's really about servant leadership of you're there for to serve people. And you really, you have to meet people where they're at and you have to ask questions to figure out where they're at. And your to-be list is instead of saying, here's the three things I have to do today. I have to do this email. I have to finish this project. It's all tasks. It's all things. Your to-be list is saying, look at the people around me. How do I want to engage them? Do I want to be present? Do I need to be more encouraging? Do I need to be more just curious what's going on? I, I have to figure out where they're at. And anybody can do this. I mean, you figure out where they're at, at and how can you make a difference there? People go through life. And the busier life gets, the society is and all that, we praise a lot about productivity, which is good, but it's about the people too. And, it, and the people are the most important thing. So how do you want them to, what kind of experience you want to give them? And a lot of times people will feel very thankful and engage and figure out it's an awesome conversation. And you only ask two questions and then just listened. It's, it's amazing. They th think it's a great conversation 
but it was really, they were talking 98% of the time, which is okay. That's being present. That's being listening, giving them empathy, helping them, you know, asking a few questions so they can get to the other side of it, uh, of a issue or a topic. So it's the to be list is about being purposefully choosing how you want to engage the people around you, whether you're at leadership training, we said the why statements about your family, it's about your work environment, it's about things that are important to you, your to be list is the same thing. A lot of times we spend so much time and energy at work, we don't have our best selves for our family and our friends. And they're the mo most important thing. And we think of our, our fa uh, interstate's family as family, but everybody has a little bit different family. And some are great, some are awesome. Everybody has, you know, as the crazy uncle, whoever, that always <laughs> makes Thanksgiving interesting and even at work. But for servant leadership, it's about engaging and being there and meeting them where they're at and trying to have a positive impact somehow. I want to go back to kind of that Venn diagram. You said, hey, if we can identify what you're great at, what you love to do and what the business needs. I'm going to remove one of those. Like if you're if you're not great at something or you're not good at it, I, th I think that's easier We've had a couple instances recently with clients where we had some talented individuals and things had changed. The dynamic had changed, whether that's internally, uh, in one case, externally within the market, where all of a sudden, what I love to do, the business doesn't really need anymore or vice versa. We really need this and you're the person for it. And the person saying, yeah, but I don't, I don't want to do that. Do you have any general principles or ways as you think about leadership when those Venn diagram, they don't fully overlap and you kind of have a little bit of conflict in there. So a lot of it is probably, and we call them tough conversations. A lot of it is being real, being open and being honest and being curious and going back to psych safety. And that's being able to be yourself and share your ideas and thoughts with, without fear of ramifications. So if they think their job is on the line, they're going to be very defensive. They're not going to really engage. So when we do career coaching and the way we're set up is you have your delivery leader, they coach from a delivery standpoint, but we have someone else that walks beside them most of the time and say they're the career coach. And the career coach is supposed to be a safer environment that says we, we could maybe give this topic to the, the person and say, go process this with your career coach. You have to look at options. So why don't you, aren't you enjoying this anymore? What do you enjoy? So they might want to pivot with their career. One of the things that we've done, we've went from a more traditional organization to an agile organization. And one of the reasons why is we want to be able to redeploy employees to where the need is and where they really see opportunities. And this is probably getting too detailed, but one of our why statements for the company, and we've had this since the Simon Sinek came out in 12, is providing opportunities for our people. So it's part of our culture of saying, okay, you don't like this, totally get that. You got to keep doing it for a while. What do you like? What does the company need? So it, let's look at your strengths, weaknesses. What are your passions? What are you doing? So it it just gives people to an opportunity to reset their career. So we've had people move from like accounting to project management. We've had people, you know, move what way different, you know, went from recruiting to, you know, being a project manager or move from project manager to something else. And, and that's great because it, they bring a different understanding to a new position and, and they can excel in that. So a lot of it is just being open to it and look for options. A lot of times, and this is just in general problem identification and solving them is everybody jumps to a solution. And when you're looking at a career path or any kind of problem, look for two to three options, pros and cons of each options, and then evaluate them. And a lot of times if you're, if you're open and honest and it's well done, it, it, you can make a good choice from that side of it. You know, sometimes people choose to leave because it doesn't fit their passion and that's okay we don't want everybody to stay just because that's part of our goal. We want them to be happy, be effective, be engaged. And it may be, we want it to be here, but we also have to be realistic that one of those options might be trying something else. And, but we'll work really, really hard to give people internal options because that way they, they bring a lot of knowledge and history and culture. And it just makes, makes the company stronger when we can move people around and redeploy them where they're passionate about and where the company needs is. That concept of like optionality. Well, let's, what if we make this decision or this one or this one? And then kind of looking, well, 
there's a lot of uncertainty. But if we got to stage two, if we choose A, will B give us another range of alternatives and options if we need to switch from there? And we've just seen, quite frankly, and I think what I'm hearing you say is that is best demonstrated and it's best incorporated in the culture when leaders just start asking questions about, tell me some different you know, alternatives or options, even if they're not great, let's just get them out. Let's get them on the table. And all of a sudden people just fall in line and you just have many more ideas and options that will just float to the surface. Yeah. And I think that a lot of times people think leaders have to solve problems and the best leaders, a lot of times let the team solve the problem. They set it up, they lead them through the, you know, really excel through the process and then be okay with whatever the team decides. They, you need get guardrails and that kind of stuff. But the best solutions are don't come from individuals. They come from teams. And that's what we believe. Yeah. You mentioned curiosity. The, the reason I love doing the podcast, the reason I love talking to guys like you is I'm just, I like kind of exploring curiosity and learning about different ideas and trying to make uh, some different connections, if not maybe to the world, at least inside my own head to make sense of what's going on. Can we talk about kind of the link between curiosity, being part of the culture, and then hiring? You have a director of innovation. And tell me a little bit about that. And maybe in the context of what we see a lot of our larger clients struggle with is you have part of this that says, kind of like you shared with me is, hey, we got to disrupt ourselves or somebody else will. Meanwhile, we have a really strong organization that consistently delivers value and part of the machine some part of that probably has a little bit of bureaucracy that that has to come with large organizations because you got a lot of people and a lot of moving parts and pieces. So tell me how you kind of balance those things between kind of keeping the routine going and doing what you guys are really good at, yet at the same time, trying to think about how you're going to deliberately intentionally change and go into kind of an unknown future. Yeah, a lot of it's uh, mindsets. So one of the mindsets we have is a growth mindset saying that, you know, how can we continue to get better? You know, we don't have it figured out yet. We're good, but how can we get one of the other, one of the other whys of ours is pursuing a better way. We can get better. We think we can, we, we have not peaked from that side of it. When you're, when you're looking at it and, and you can, you can have some fun with it saying, Hey, every solution that you create just created like two other problems that have to be solved tomorrow. So when you've been at an organization long enough, you start seeing, Oh yeah, we made this decision 10 years ago and I was part of that. Now we got to fix the problem that it created because there's no perfect solution. So when you're, when you're looking at it is it's, it's a continuous process. You can't hurry up and sprint to get caught up with the marketplace. You have to be always training. You always have to be engaged. And that creates that muscle of curiosity, vulnerability to say, Hey, this is my area and I can get better at it, but I'm going to have to get outside view. So asking people to evaluate you and they're evaluating your baby and sometimes your baby's ugly and, and that's hard to hear. But through that process, you can say, oh, yeah, that is that's not what we were trying to do, but that's the way it kind of evolved over time. So it's it's inviting outside perspectives. It's just part of the growth mindset, looking at what is not working as well or where is the weakest spot? Can we get that better or are we getting the results that we want? And it's just, it starts with the mindset, I think, uh, at least I think that's the way I believe. And if you don't have that mindset, then you're about producing as much as possible. And if you do that, you can have a great run. It could be a five-year run. It could be a 25-year run. But for us, we want to create an enduring organization that is going to be around. We've been around for 70 years. And our, our goal is to pass along the company and the culture to the next generation. And we want to leave interstates better than when, when we got here. And, you know, some will be better, some might not be as well, but we want, it's that constant, constant sharpening of the saw, trying to make sure that we're personally getting better, that our team is, is getting better and the company is getting better. And how can I serve my team better? How can I serve our clients better? How can we make even a bigger difference? And if you have those things, I think that's just a, it's an easy recipe to say, where do we need to innovate? Where do we need to disrupt ourselves? And, and our challenge is we almost need to have more focus on where we want it. We want to improve everything all the time. And that, that's like overkill. So we have to figure out how to channel that focus of saying, let's get better in just a few areas this year, these areas next year. Let's pace ourselves. We don't have to rush to do this. The one comment you made that I just loved is that when you have the CEO saying, we have not peaked, 
I think of my fear. My fear was, did I peak in high school? Like, is that the best it's ever going to be? And I think we all have some version of that. Or maybe it was college or maybe it was, you know, 25 before I got married or whatever it is. But to hear a CEO say, listen, however good we're doing and we're helping build America and we're delivering value to our customers and we're doing all these things and we're developing people we have not peaked. We need to get better. I think that is so powerful. I love the way you phrase that. Yeah. And you can have fun with it. One of the things I've done at the EIL, we give them space to ask me any type of questions. So we do that throughout the year with town halls, but it's a very intimate setting where you just have 18 people and a couple leaders. And and I, occasionally I'll joke around as saying, I have to decide when I'm going to peak as a leader, me personally. And my goal is I hope I peak either my last day at interstates or my first day of retirement after interstates. That's my goal. So I have, you know, if I got nine years left, I want to get better every single year till that last day. And maybe that's not the right one, but I know in my mind, every day I can be a better leader if I really, really try. Yeah. Every now and then someone will admit that we're kind of coaching. They'll just admit like, yeah, yeah kind of complacent right now, kind of like where I'm at, making good money. I kind of like it here. And for every one of those, there's probably another 10 or 20 or hundred folks who, whether it's self-deception or they're just kind of keeping it quiet, are just kind of like where they're at. But I, again, I, I love that when, when you have the CEO of the organization saying, we get to pick that. That's a choice that we get to make. Yeah. When are we going to peak? And what does that mean? And therefore... It means how are you getting better from today? And if, and if you can't name something, well, all right, that's an opportunity for us to dig into it. Scott, if you will, maybe allow me to nerd out just for a minute on this director of innovation role, because when you have someone in this role, and even if you said, you know, hey, broadly speaking, you have sustaining innovation, which is largely incremental, but we're always improving or truly disruptive that we are, we're totally changing kind of what we're doing either way. When there's a human being that sits in that role and has a business card, you are, you know, when they walk around, they're looking to make things better, very intentionally. Yeah. Maybe tell me a little bit about your innovation journey there of actually putting someone in that role. So one of the best things that we're hoping to get out, it's a relatively new position. We don't want this person to be the expert, the, the guru of saying this needs to change, this needs to change. Sure. We want this person to be a catalyst, an enabler. They're almost like a strength coach for the football team that they go out in their world and say, okay, you're, you got this problem. Let's innovate. Let's figure out what to do differently. Do we need to do a little bit of innovation like through Kaizen or do we have to totally redesign this? And challenging our thinking of saying, here's the problem, but is that a symptom or is that the root issue? Because you could solve a ton of symptoms, but you're not taking care of the root issue. So let's upstream it. Let's try to think differently. And if maybe you change these two little things and that takes care of the whole problem. And so for us, this is, we feel that we're going to be able to elevate our game on innovation and disrupting ourselves and being more productive. We truly believe that. But the best thing is going to be from the culture side of it. It's going to take our pursuing a better way to more focus, more impactful, and really be able to say that this is the way we innovate. And this is the way we're going to innovate for the next little while. And we'll have, we might have to change it up in five years or whatever, but disrupt ourselves again. But this is a huge opportunity for us as an organization to get great at innovation, not just one person. Yeah. I love that. Cause you're right. I feel sometimes this conversation comes up similar with safety. It's like, well, I don't know. Scott's a safety guy. So it's the safety. If you talk to him and you're over here saying, no, no, no. Safety can't just be me. I can't just be one person who's in charge of this. We all have to live it. And to your point, it really comes down to that mindset. And there's mental models, there's frameworks to how to think in a way that increases the likelihood of innovation, small or large or sustaining or disrupting. So I love that. And uh, But I, again, I think kudos to you because there are other companies that talk about innovation. And I'm not saying it's hard to do or impossible to do when you don't have someone in that role. But the minute you do that, you know, they have a position, they got a title, they have a salary, they got a budget. They're there to do things that help change the future. And you've made that really explicit. Yeah. And I, I think it's also 
looking into the future, it's a little bit of offense and defense. There's so many things changing in technology. There's so many, we really think our industries that we're in are going to be disruptive. And if, and if you're good at adapting and seeing that opportunity, uh, because every time there's an issue, every time there's a problem, every time there's a disruption, there's winners and losers. You can look at it as a challenge or you can look at it as an opportunity. The innovation mindset is going to help us take anything that is disruptive and turn it into an opportunity. And we'll be way better positioned in 2025 or 2030, whatever it may be. But we're going to be ready and be able to take advantage of those disruptions that are happening in the environment and to our clients and to our competitors and to us that we'll be able to seize those opportunities. Yeah, the whole crux of the innovator's dilemma by Clayton Christensen is big, successful, profitable companies today, what makes them vulnerable is exactly what makes them successful today. And there's something that is, it's small, it's cheap, it doesn't fit, it doesn't, it's not relevant to your core customers now. And you ignore it. And then in three or four or five years, all of a sudden, here it is, and it's already has this whole momentum. So again, that concept of just thinking defensively, which is other people are going to be doing this either intentionally or unintentionally that will affect us. Again, we got the mental models. We're looking for it. It's in our view. Uh, I think that's really powerful. So let me transition here, Scott. Our paths cross a little bit as you are kind of broadening and you, correct me. I don't want to paraphrase for you, but really broadening your own view of talent and where it comes from, how do we develop it and how you can become an employer of choice to the best talent available anywhere, certainly including the Hispanic demographic. Maybe tell me a little bit about what you guys are doing and how you're going about changing the culture, either in ways small or large, to really make it a place where the Hispanic demographic and people who maybe have their primary language of Spanish still be a great place to work. Yeah, it, it, it's definitely a journey. And one of the things that has happened in the last 10 years is our percentage of Hispanics has grown. So we have a substantial number of Hispanics within the interstates family. And when we're looking at it is to be the best we can be to make sure that our culture is strong as possible is that people have to feel like they belong. And one of the most important things in that realm is that they belong. We communicate in a way that's approachable. So what we're trying to do is work on Spanish, making sure that we can actually communicate effectively with that and, and vice versa. So making sure that they feel more comfortable communicating with us, us with them, because that bond and that approachability and that feeling connected and belonging will be stronger from that side of it. We also want to make sure that we don't inadvertently don't provide more as many opportunities for any demographic group. So a lot of times we get comfortable, whether it's processes or culture or environment or markets, and we just do the same old. We kind of just start a little bit of social loafing and just going through the motions. So this is an opportunity for us to make sure that we're doubling down on engagement of all of our team members. But this is really highlighting what those challenges are. And it could be different groups going forward. But there is there is a shortage of people that's going to be out there for a long time. And we want to make sure we're getting the best and the brightest of people that fit into our culture, regardless of what pool they come from. We believe we can help people reach their potential and make a difference and that they can have a great career with us regardless of where they're located at or demographics, but we have to make sure we are pushing ourselves to make sure that we're approachable, we're learning, we're improving, we're listening to them and making sure that we understand that our intentions might be great, but sometimes our actions may not come across as, as well as our intentions. And we can't be offended when that happens. That feedback is really a gift. That's an opportunity for us to get better. And by doing that, and listening to that and really pushing ourselves to make sure that we're communicating well with the Hispanics. That's going to allow us to open up other demographics, but it's, it's a challenge out there. The world is hyper competitive on the labor market. And if you're not great, you're going to struggle getting them and keeping them. And we want to make sure that when, once you're part of the interstates family, we'd love to have everyone till they, they, they retire. Sometimes that works out, sometimes that doesn't, but we are family and we want to support each other. And you got to make sure you go that extra mile and do it in a way that's the platinum rule 
communicate the way they want to be communicated to talk about opportunities the way they want to talk about opportunities, not the way we want to do it. And, and it goes back to that servant leadership. And, and I think it's our responsibility as, as a company to raise the bar and or try to raise the bar for our industry and just societies in general. Yeah. That golden rule, the idea that I'm going to treat other people as I would like to be treated. Well, that works. If you and I, we, we grew up in the same place and we went to the same schools and we think that we we're confident we think the same way, but that idea of the platinum rule, which is, Oh no, I got to understand them and then treat them in a way that they would like to be treated. All of a sudden that's, that's a really important nuance that really changes it there. Yeah. We, we have a couple employees over in Germany and I was talking to one of them just a couple months ago. And I said, what's the difference? You know, all that kind of stuff. And one comment he made really blew me away. So what's the one question that is number two normally when you meet a new person? What's your name? What do you do? In Germany, if you ask what do they do, you're being rude. They don't talk about work. That's rude outside of work. So he said he, he was hanging out with one of his best friends they ended up doing basically the same thing. He took them 12 months to figure that out because in Germany, that's how it's a platinum rule. They don't talk about work. So us as Americans, we don't know that. We think everybody talks about work and you go over there and you, and you could actually be offending people and not even know it just because you're trying to be friendly. You're acting from your perspective, not on trying to empathize or relate to where where they're coming from. So that just blew me away. And how many other situations happen that in the United States, whether it's different areas of the country, demographics or whatever, there's so many assumptions we have of what people want and how they want to engage that it's, it's a great opportunity for us to get better and a great opportunity to really attract people from all over the country. Well, I think especially with the Hispanic demographic too, there's that mindset of, hey, are we are we working to live or are we living to work? And I think I can tell you for our own business, my wife and I work together in our business. Lately, we've been living to work and it's just been nonstop. And we're like, what are we doing this for? How do we slow down and make sure we're enjoying this? Because, you know, you, you get the kids involved and time flies. Different cultures think differently about this. And it's subtle things about the first thing is, hey, what do you do versus tell me about your family, right? Yep. What yeah. really, and I think that to you guys, why I think you guys are in a really good position to make strides on this is because you already have that. You've already helped people from the very beginning think about their why, think about what really drives them beyond the work itself. That's the core of, I think, being human and wanting to be a part of that team. And, and even if you're coming in as like a first level apprentice, trying to get them to see that there's a vision of a career here. This isn't a paycheck. This can be a paycheck if you choose that, but there's more there. We'll invest in you. We'll help you become a journeyman. We'll help you get you know additional training if you're a computer programmer. We'll help you if there's additional training out there. We'll invest in you and we'll help you have a great career here. That means that it can last a long time. It's not just paycheck to paycheck. I'm just, you know, it's not transactional. This is about real relationship that hopefully is mutually beneficial and and is cherished on both sides. Yeah. So I'm watching the time here again. I really enjoyed not only this conversation, Scott, but also the one that was largely of equal length prior to this. Can you tell me, is you think back on maybe the books that you've read? I know you're a book reader. Are there specific books that stand out that really helped you become a better leader or maybe a recent book that you've read? We've touched on a couple already, but anything that we haven't talked about that you said, this is a book that really either A, helped you in your career or that you've read, but you also recommend to other young leaders to help speed and accelerate their uh, own leadership journey. Well, I'll do a little bit of both because you'll find out how old I am when I start telling some of the books that I read. <laughs> but one of the most important, impactful one was actually from Stephen Covey. It was just one chapter. It's first things first. From there, in 96, I read the book and I went to a training and, and I wrote my own personal mission statement back in 96. And I've had it ever since. So that's understanding the importance of the, your why statement, your personal mission statement. That gives you so, so much direction and it helps you be comfortable in your own skin. 
the, it's a hard read, but the fifth discipline is really was it impactful from a systems thinking standpoint, mental models, uh, and a built to last and good to great with Jim Collins. That inspired us to write uh, our core values back in 96 also. And then lately, it's probably been the motive by Patrick Lencioni. That's about, hey, the servant leadership shouldn't be called servant leadership. It should just be leadership. That's the only leadership that should be out there. And there's so many great books. A lot of it is where do you want to grow in as a person, as a leader, and then find the right book from that side of it. There's a, you know, the greatest leadership principles is an older book, but that's a great, one of the best ones about servant leadership. And it makes you, makes you check yourself and make sure you're leading your why for leading. Why do you want to lead and making sure that it's agrees with your mission statement and it's the way you want to lead. It, there's a lot of distractions in the world and, and the more you can stay centered on your focus and figure out how to adapt and how to, how to make a difference. I think the better off you're going to be from that side of it. Yeah. The fifth discipline, uh, but Peter Senge, I believe is, yeah. it is dense, but uh, it is one where we're working with a client and they, they were really striving for kind of continuous learning, continuous innovation and looking for some models and that, that idea of systems thinking. And it had been, I think, I had to read it in my MBA class, but it was one where I pulled it off and kind of jumped in. And it's one of those books that I can just kind of crack open and then look and like, uh Oh, that was 90 minutes ago. I, I'm sure I should be doing something else, but it's really powerful. So you gave me the motive that I have not read. So uh, I appreciate that. I will pick that up. Yeah. Even Patrick Lencioni said it was probably his best, his best book and the one he should have wrote first, but you know, a lot of times people don't understand that as authors, they grow and they develop and they mature their thinking and, and they, they can frame things differently. And he's one of my favorite authors. And, and uh, but it's pretty funny to say his best book was one of his last ones. Patrick Lencioni can say things like that when you've had like, I, his name comes up often on this show and yeah. having read, I think I've read at least four or five of his books is they're just really, they're accessible. The ideal team player, when they write it about a construction company, Tailor made for guys like us, but uh, for him to say, "Yeah, this is probably the best one." It's like, yeah, they're, they're all they're all pretty darn good. So that's that's yeah. great. Well, hey, Scott, I know you're a busy man. I've really enjoyed this, and sometimes we'll we'll have folks on, and sometimes we stray a little bit, and I'll say like, "Hey, I'm gonna try to bring this back to this the leadership concept that is in the name of the podcast." You have made this extremely easy with all the things that you guys are doing within interstates to really focus on leadership and make it part of the culture and make it part of the process day in and day out. So I applaud your efforts there and congrats on all your success. And I'm excited to see what you guys do in the future. So thank you. Well, I appreciate the time. And uh, if it's okay, I'd, I'd share one of the first things that I share with our, one of our EIL classes. And our goal is to help you understand who you can be as a leader. What we don't want you to be is try to mimic someone or become a leader like you've seen. We don't want you to copycat someone. The way for you to be your best leader, the best leader you can be, is to figure out how to figure out your leader's voice and figure out how do you can lead with your strengths and weaknesses. If you can make it from a personal standpoint, you will be able to get really close to your, your potential as opposed to trying to just look like a leader. We want you to lead the best way you can be, and that's being yourself and making sure that you're doing it with good intent from a servant leadership perspective. Mr. Scott Peterson, I think that is a wonderful place to end. Thank you. You bet. Thank you for the time. I definitely enjoyed it. All right, then, friends, how did that go? Hopefully you enjoyed my conversation with Mr. Scott Peterson. There was a lot there on the function of leadership and how to execute it on how to teach it on how to think about it. Scott, I loved, really talked about these different mental models and these frameworks. And I think those are so important. And when it comes to leadership or innovation or anything else, if we don't have these mental models in our heads on how we think about these different problems or challenges we face, it's often that means we're just shooting from the hip and we're going with our gut, which isn't always a negative. However, it's nice to have a thoughtful framework. And there's a lot of these that are out there and at least have a few of these on different ways that we can think about them. And uh, again, hopefully you captured a few of those that we talked about in this episode. Our goal is to make this the best 
podcasts you listen to. So if you have ideas for future guests or topics or have a question to submit that me and my team will put our heads to in the form of an asking for a friend segment, do not hesitate to email me directly at bradley at bradleyhartmanandco.com. I know there's two Bradleys. It's a mouthful. It's a little annoying, but we'll be fine. We'll get through it. My email, again, bradley at bradleyhartmanandco.com. Again, if you got value from this episode with Scott, it would mean a lot to us and presumably him, I don't know, uh, that you could rate and review this episode. That means more to us than you know. Again, this episode is brought to you by the Simple Sales Pipeline. If you are not consistently and with discipline organizing and valuing your future sales with a sales pipeline, you, my friend, are flying blind. Not a problem. We can solve this in 30 minutes or less by using our custom-built Simple Sales Pipeline. Where can you learn more? Well, you can Google it or you can simply type in the Simple Sales Pipeline. Dot com. So thank you. I appreciate your time and attention. So once again, thank you for listening. And if you are only listening to this, you are missing out on the video component that we are investing in to make it easier for you to engage with the content, learn from the guests like we've had, like Scott Peterson, and to share with your team. So go to YouTube, subscribe to Bradley Hartman and Co. We're putting nearly every single episode there as well in its entirety, as well in smaller chunks. So hopefully that's another way we can deliver value to you. Speaking of which, this is how we close out with our leadership mantra. You, my friend, are owed nothing. Deliver value first. Make it a great week.